Mark Jackson, a native Washingtonian, has spent his career in public service, helping some of the most difficult cases of truant youth that require court intervention. Mark Jackson has spent the last 25 years serving some of the most vulnerable populations of our city. Many of these individuals, now parents themselves, know Mark on a first name basis and have stayed in touch throughout the years. Mark is one of those uh, managers that, that does not mind getting in the quote unquote weeds. It's nothing for Mark to see a kid on the street, pick him up and take him to school because that's where he needs to be. He knew all of our kids' names. Parents knew Mr. Jackson on a first name basis. I always admired that in Mr. Jackson. Mark would be here sometimes at 10 or 11 o'clock at night doing the work, reviewing the cases. At that particular moment in time, Mark Jackson was the only person who could have handled that status of the case law in the manner that it was handled in. We um, worked together on a calendar that we called the Person in Need of Supervision Calendar. The acronym is PINS. It was at the time when the number of cases coming into that calendar was on the rise. The families that we tend to see in the PINS calendar are families that need a wide array of services. Youth in particular need services like functional family therapy or trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. They need support with school. One of the things that Mr. Jackson did was that he was very effective in getting all of the workers of the status offender unit to connect the families and the youth under their supervision with the necessary services. That's something that up until that time I don't think we have been doing in as a comprehensive basis. I mean, because one thing his staff is always on point. With whatever his vision was, that's what their vision was, and that, that, that's a credit to him. I was very excited when I heard that um, Mark had won the Kayford Service Award because he is so deserving. And it was a long overdue recognition of the excellence and the passion that he brought to his work over such an extended period of time. And we hope that we can make him as proud one day. Sure. Uh, Mark Jackson is Supervisory Probation Officer in the District of Columbia Courts. My staff knows I'll cry in a heartbeat, and I hadn't seen that, so. Uh, I have a number of thanks. I would like to thank Mr. Kayfritz and the Kayfritz Foundation for this award and the wonderful work that they have done in the city for so many years. I'd like to thank the George Washington University Center for Excellence, and of course, Kate and Jason for that wonderful video and they guided us winners through three months of interviews, videotaping, photo shoots that made us look and feel like movie stars. Uh, I'd also like to congratulate the other winners and finalists, many of whom we have partnered with in court social services in tackling the issue of truancy in the District of Columbia. We have worked with APRA for substance abuse, who's represented, Department of Behavioral Health for Mental Health Services, and one of our closest stakeholders in the Status Offender Unit, who could very easily be behind this podium today, Ms. Hillary Cairns, who we have partnered with for, yeah, give it up for Hillary. <laughs> who we have partnered with for many years in diverting youth from the juvenile justice system to the pro to our program. I also would like to recognize finalist Franklin Malone, who is a retiree of Court Social Services, a mentor of mine, and continues his phenomenal work with his 100 Fathers program. Frank. <laughs> Jason, get some good pictures, because I'm bordering up. But. <laughs> And of course, my superior court and court social services family. What a wonderful place to work. 
I'd like to thank our Chief Judge, Lee Satterfield, whose leadership over the years has resulted in our court receiving national recognition for our innovative programming and customer service. Ms. Terry Odom, our Director of Court Social Services. who allowed me to take risk and chances, and even in those instances where I fell short, she would refer to them as quote unquote teachable moments. <laughs> the Honorable Haram Pugh Lugo, uh, our presiding judge of the family court, thank you for coming, Fanny Barksdale. Stephen Dean, Lydia Curtis, Jennifer Snow, Cheryl Rogers Brown, and Lawrence Weaver, thank you for your recommendations and your participation in my portfolio. And last but by no means least, I want to thank my family and friends and colleagues from the court and court social services for all your congratulatory wishes over the past few months. This right here, it's not my speech, thank God for you and me. <laughs> But this is a truancy referral, some 40 pages representing a child who is truant from the District of Columbia school system. Last academic year, my team received well over 1,000 of these, resulting in high caseloads. Each one of the referrals not only represented a child who is truant, but a child who is angry, a child who may be bullied, a family in need, poor. Put people first. These kids and family don't come to us willingly. They are sometimes resistant. And maybe they have been involved in numerous systems that have failed them in the past. Or maybe they've just given up. Those of you who work in the human services field can identify with this. We put people first. The successes are sometimes rare. They may come immediately or years later when the case is closed. But when it works, particularly in the case of a child, it is a wonderful thing. When you have changed an individual's life course based on the interventions you have put in place, a referral that you submitted, or how you counseled them, there's no feeling like it in the world to change someone's life for the better. When you run into that child years later as an adult, maybe they've graduated from college, maybe they have a family and are married, and they remember you with a smile. You've done it. You've done it because you put people first. You put the paper down. You opened your door. You didn't have them waiting while you were on the phone. You may have greeted them with a smile. It is often the small things that make the difference. This has been my goal with every family and every child that I have worked with in my 25-year career. And what I encourage in every team that I've worked with over the past 12 years, putting people first. I learned this at an early age from my mother, Ms. Audrey Simmons, who is here. Mom, I don't know if you can fill up to it, the standing. Mom, I thank you for the guidance. I thank you for the work ethic. And I thank you for setting the foundation. I saw my mom taking neighbors taking relatives, taking people who were not well, who needed assistance, and asking for nothing in return. And she's still doing it today. As a manager in the Postal Service for many years, she also taught me to be good to my staff, put people first. I stand true to this, putting them first as much as I possibly can making them a priority, promoting their growth and professional development, sharing with them, coaching them, and laughing with them. And with this in mind, 
I'd like to lastly thank my dynamic team from last year, the Status Offender and Juvenile Behavior Diversion Program. And if you guys are here, just stand Joe McToodle, <laughs> Vanita McCray, Kenrick Goldborn, Tawana Blocker, Stephen Dean, Robert Bacon, Alandia Bass, Cecil Bates, Tiffany McCoy, LeBanuel Guy, Morella Howard, and our program manager, Sheila Robeson Adams. In closing, I'd like to believe that I am receiving this prestigious award because I chose to put people first. Sometimes it's not easy, and the benefits may not come right away, but in the long run, when you put people first, oftentimes, in return, they'll put you first. Thank you.